Good morning to all of you and welcome to worship on this day. I am so thrilled to be with all of you this morning and to be coming to the table of our Lord Jesus Christ, freshly reminded as I imagine we all are of how deeply and desperately we need the hand of God upon us and upon the life of our nation in this season. I'm not going to use this place to repeat the sort of statements that I know that you've heard many times in the news coverage of yesterday's violence in Butler, Pennsylvania. As I said in my sermon on June the 30th, when you get to the point where restating obvious moral principles is necessary, then you know that you've sunk to a place where repentance is very, very much needed. We are at that point as a country. Uh, We are certainly at that place as individuals in many cases. We need humility. We need clarity, we need anything but the arrogance or the anger that is easy to rise up in moments like these. We need sincere obedience to the way of Jesus, not just a deeper devotion to our factions. We need a newfound commitment to the very best aspirations for all people that once made American democracy the beacon of hope for people everywhere. We need a rigorous resolve individually and corporately to oppose the tactics of hatred and caricature and violence that are the true enemy of God's good purposes in our time. And so if you're asking yourself, what should I be doing right now as a citizen? What should I be telling my children? What should I be saying in my social circles? Let me suggest an answer. What's happening in our world right now in many places is a sign that we have drifted a long way from God. We would do well to root our lives afresh much more deeply in Christ, to follow his commandment, to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us. We will be better off if we live by the scripture's counsel to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, As the Apostle Paul said, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with all people and overcome evil with good. And because it's hard to do that, easy to say, but so very, very hard to do these things, it occurs to me that we might above all on this day throw ourselves into the arms of God in prayer. And I invite you to bow your head with me as we do that together. Lord, we are sorrowful to admit that this is not close to the first time that we have heard gunshots ringing out in public places. This isn't the first time we've seen public figures or common people become the targets of extremists and madmen. We are exhausted by it. We want to live in a healthier country. We want to be healthier people. And so we ask you, Lord, to bring comfort to those families who mourn today. We ask you, Lord, to protect the life of Donald Trump and Joe Biden and all who seek to serve our commonwealth and who stand in harm's way. But do not let us be deluded again, Lord, that our ultimate salvation lies in politics and human laws and human securities alone. For it is you, God, it is the way of your kingdom, Jesus, that is our personal hope and that of every nation. You are the one, Lord, who can make us well. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray today, saying together, amen. Would you observe with me now this moment of silent preparation as we open our hearts afresh to the God of all hope, and then we'll be led together into the further worship of God.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Please rise and join me in our call to worship and respond with our hymn of adoration. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. followed by the Gloria Patri. O God, by your power, may we with all the saints comprehend the breadth and length and height and depth of your love that surpasses knowledge so that we may be filled with your fullness. Fill our worship with grace, Lord Jesus Christ, that every thought, word, and deed may be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. seated. Psalm 22, 23 to 24 compels us to confession in his presence. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. 
for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. Let us now join our voices in unison in this prayer of confession. O oh God, early in the morning I cry to you. Help me to pray and concentrate my thoughts on you. I cannot do this alone. In me there is darkness, but with you there is light. In me there is hurt, but in you there is healing. I am lonely, but you do not leave me. I am feeble in heart, but with you there is help. I am restless, but with you there is peace. In me there is bitterness, but with you there is patience. I do not understand your ways, but you know the way for me. Through Christ Jesus, may I find refuge. Take away my sins and let me sing for joy. Cover me with your favor as with a shield. In Christ we pray, amen. Psalm 103, 11 through 13 offers assurance with these words. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Let us now profess our shared faith using the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
You may be seated. As our ushers now come forward, listen to these words from King David. Psalm 111, verse 1 says, Let us give thanks to the Lord with all our being in the company of the upright. Let us honor God for the blessings and goodness we have received. And in Psalm 116, we read, What shall I return to the Lord for his bounty to me? I will give what I have promised in the presence of all God's people. Let us continue the worship as we bring his tithes and our offerings. We have one further opportunity to enjoy the gifts of this uh, remarkable staff member, Jordan Heinzel Nelson, before she takes off in August to become a student at Duke Divinity School. And we have been blessed richly in our missions department and in many other places uh, with Jordan's gifts. And uh, we thank uh, her once again, as well as Mary Ann, for the gift of the music this morning. I want to invite you to listen with me to a story from the life of Jesus. Where do we go in times of trouble and turmoil? Wisely, we go to Jesus. And I want to invite us to listen to this text, which may have even deeper meaning for us today than uh, when I anticipated speaking on this topic, and welcome you to hear with me the word of God as it comes from the gospel according to St. John, the fifth chapter, beginning at the first verse. Hear then the word of the Lord. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid 
for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, there, there, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. The belief was that an angel came and stirred the water, and when the water stirred, there was healing properties in the water. He said, while I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's so much in this story that I find fascinating. And one of those elements is simply the very truth of the tale. Uh, skeptics have often suggested through the centuries that the stories we read in the Bible, especially ones that seem to have uh, miraculous actions taking place, are mostly made up, including this one. In fact, back in the 1700s, liberal critics scoffed at the details of the story, at the very notion of a pool that had five colonnades around it. Who ever heard of a five-sided pool? pool, they said. It's just a, it's a made-up story trying to make a theological message. Those colonnades symbolize the five books of the Old Testament, the Torah, and this is simply a, a, a religious myth, this entire storyline. Then in the late 1800s, archaeologists who were digging near one of the major entrances to Jerusalem, in fact, the one where sheep used to be herded into the city, uncovered the ruins of an ancient ritual bath. And guess what? It was five-sided. And they found there the foundations of what had been, at some point, columned porticos on each side, just as the Bible describes. Another thing I find fascinating about this particular story is the description of the sort of people who used to come to this pool. Uh, they were not the glistening sunbathers or the romping children or the well-toned athletes that we associate with the pools of our era. They were instead disabled people, the lame the blind, the paralyzed, people who could not see, people who couldn't walk, people who couldn't move the way they undoubtedly wanted to, people whose lives were constrained by some disability. Many of you are aware that one of the commitments that we have made as a congregation in our two-year lift initiative is to pay more attention to people who find themselves with these conditions and challenges. We've established over the last uh, two years or, or 18 months, a disability ministry. We're, we've hired a director for this. We've recruited volunteers for this. We're building facilities for this. Uh, we're very committed and excited to show to the people of our wider community our respect for the dignity of disabled persons and, and to come alongside them as brothers and sisters in Christ and to walk together, to journey together with Jesus. Uh, this was not, however, at the time that this story takes place, a common practice. Uh, there were not disability ministries uh, happening in the life of the Jewish synagogue or many other places. Uh, in fact, it was common in the first century to view people who had disabilities as cursed by God. They were paying the price for somebody's uh, direct sin. Holy people and religious leaders uh, routinely avoided even getting close to people who had uh, any kind of disability or disease out of fear that they carried a sort of spiritual uncleanness that might rub off on you, that might taint you. The area around the pool of Bethesda, therefore, would have been viewed by so-called healthy people as an infectious zone, okay? Like, sort of like a, a COVID environment. Uh, only worse. So, so what's really fascinating in, in this particular narrative is that Jesus went there. <laughs> 
Jesus went there. The person who, in truth, was the most holy person in that uh, region. Certainly, in fact, we would argue the world. Uh, the individual who was most spiritually clean, the most able to go anywhere else on that Jewish festival weekend, he chose to go there. He chose to be among the disabled, the diseased, those who lay around the pool of Bethesda, and to pour out his grace upon a man who'd been an invalid for 38 years. As you know, it doesn't always work that way. God, uh, the one that Jesus represents for us all, uh, God does not choose in every instance to heal people of their disabilities or diseases. At least not in this life. We, we may not know till heaven uh, just how somebody's uh, differences or their difficulties served God's purposes in some way that we couldn't see in our era or in ways that were intended to shape our hearts, perhaps. But one of the messages that I take from this story and from many other stories in the New Testament is that not only do our infirmities and our vulnerabilities not make God avoid us the way the religious people at that time avoided disabled persons or diseased persons, not only do not make him avoid us, they actually seem to attract him to us. They actually seem to draw God in his mercy and grace and power and truth and love and wisdom and all that God has toward us. We slip into thinking, I believe, sometimes that Jesus, who is the Son of God, is most interested in us when we have our act together, when we're behaving well, when our record's clean, when our lives are all healthy, uh, when our nation is at peace. But the Bible teaches us that God is actually most interested in meeting us, not at our point of ability, but at our point of disability. Not at the peak of our health, but at the place of our disease. To make this very point, three of the four Gospels uh, describe an occasion when Jesus was being criticized by the Pharisees for hanging around with people who plainly had problems, problems moral or otherwise. And this is how Jesus responded in each of those instances. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous. I'm not here primarily to gather the righteous around me, but sinners. In other words, my main interest isn't in people who have everything right. Uh, how many people have everything right? Uh, they, they can take care of themselves, seems to be the implication of Jesus' words here. I've come for people who know that their lives are not right, and who want help with that, specifically God's help with that. Now, when you read the word sinners there, I know it's common to translate that word as people who do wrong things. And that's certainly a dimension of a good definition of sin. Sin is the act of doing something wrong. But biblically speaking, the concept of sin is is bigger than that. And it's critical to understand that if we are to deal with sin uh, holistically and helpfully. Biblically speaking, sin isn't just a behavior, it's the underlying condition that accounts for those behaviors. Uh, and, and a lot of the other problems of life uh, since the fall of mankind as recorded in Genesis. Sin is a state of not rightness. It, not rightness in ourselves, not rightness in the world around us that comes from a loss of connection, a loss of communion with God. And, and it's the absence, sin is the absence of the, of the kind of full health that Adam and Eve, the scriptures say, had when they lived in full communion with God. 
the kind of health that we see in Jesus' beautiful way of being and doing in the world, the kind of magnificent health that, thank goodness, you and I will one day enjoy when Jesus makes all things new. Sin is the opposite of the condition that leads to health and the condition that leads to the behaviors we associate with sin. So to say that I'm a sinner, and, it, and it's, a, it's an act of reality, it's a de- definition of reality to say I, I am a sinner, to say that is simply to acknowledge that not only do I do wrong things, but I am not right. I am not right, as in fully healthy, spiritually, relationally, physically, and in a myriad of other ways. And I live in a world of other not right people and in a nation of other not right people. Do you think about this? How do you think about this? Do you ever think about what is not healthy? What is not as whole as you or God would like it to be? And how that might get better? Is this... Is this something that's on our screens? Personally, I have moments of clarity about this. Um, There are times when I perceive that my life uh, is marred or marked by what I will call the three H's. The three H's. It's in some ways an escape for me to think about sin as just a distant theological condition, but, but it's actually more helpful for me to, to think about the particularity of the way that sin, brokenness, disease, lack of health, spiritual and other forms of disability operate. Uh, the first of the three H's that I want to think about with you is signified by the word hurts, hurts. A hurt is a life experience that may have damaged your heart. I don't mean the muscle, I mean your orientation to the world. Perhaps you experienced a strike against you at some point that affected your ability to deal with the world in a healthy way. Whether that strike was intended or not, something got twisted in your view of yourself or, or, or of God or of other people and it still influences the way you are coming at life. Over the years, I've talked with so many people who have experienced some form of abuse from an authority figure when they were young or they went through a violent change of circumstances in their life, a big loss that was just so painful. And even though it's been many, many years since that time, that particular event, even though there have been many good people and lots of steady periods in their life, that original hurt is still with them. And it makes it hard for them to fully trust other people. It leaves them with a kind of apprehensive, low-level anxiety that the rug could be tugged out from beneath them at any point. And this condition destabilizes their life. It it blocks the full health of their lives. My question to you is, are there any hurts that may be playing an oversized role in your life? And how are you going after those? How are you bringing those to Jesus? How are you asking him to help you get well in that area? The second place that that sin gets expressed in our lives is through our habits. Uh, For for many of us, certain actions get started as a perceived remedy for some problem in our life, but they they end up being a chronic bad behavior or or even an an addiction. Uh, I've shared with you in the past that I, I began secretly smoking when I was in my 30s. And the odd thing about it was, it was my remedy. What was the remedy for? The anxiety I felt over having to get up and preach. 
uh, uh, writing a sermon was just so anxiety producing for me that I, that I, that I took to my little nicotine helper as, as my way of getting through that anxiety. That little tobacco assistant ended up nearly costing me my life when I had a heart attack in my early 50s. Um, bad habits are these default scripts that run on repeat when the going gets tough, but which actually make the, the going even tougher over time. And so I wonder, are you wrestling with any of these kinds of common habits? Uh, is there now an ingrained pattern in your life that, that isn't doing you or maybe people around you any favors? One of my favorite Bible verses is the text where Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The idea there is that God wants all of us to have a life that is filled up with, with his help and with real hope and with genuine health. But unexamined hurts and unexamined habits block us from that kind of abundance. Uh, and there is a third deadly H that I would add to that list that can also stop us from going as far as God wants us to go in his plan for his goodness in our lives. And I'm speaking of hang-ups. Hang-ups. Hang-ups are destructive ways of coming at life that are shaped by bent or unbiblical thinking. Uh, Hang-ups are, 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 are ways of thinking that get rooted in our minds when we're, often when we're young, and then they develop into unhealthy attitudes that we come to accept, and we uh, use them to live by as a means of getting through life and I think of two stories in this connection. One was a, a, a gentleman I know, I think I told this story many, many years ago, who was out on a, on a simple hunting, bird hunting trip with a friend and, and his friend's father and his own dad, and he accidentally discharged his gun, and it killed his very best friend. And he ended up going to the funeral and came back from the funeral, and, and, and his parents said to him, in effect, we will speak of this no more. No more. And that young man was, was blocked from doing the grieving that was so critical to redeeming in some small way this terrible tragedy, this, this, this error and this loss. And I got to watch him move through decades after that. And he would come up to moments where, where, where really allowing feelings in and then to rise authentically and then to respond appropriately was absolutely needed. And he couldn't do it. Because he did, he'd, he'd in some way adopted this false form of thinking, thou shalt not grieve. I was a little boy and I was playing outside on the front lawn with an older relative of mine and we were having a wrestling match and, uh, and I would struggle to break free and I would sometimes get free of this much stronger person's grasp and I'd be running away and the person would reach out and he'd cuff my ankles together. It would hurt as they hit together and then bam, I'd hit the ground. And this would happen a few times. And eventually, I began to tear up and to cry at the sheer frustration of not being able to get away and at the frustration of the pain of hitting the ground so hard again and again. And the relative looked at me and pointed at me and said, you're losing the game. And I began to learn the lesson. I adopted the mentality that when you show vulnerability, when you admit hurt, you're losing the game. And I spent years trying to recover from that hang-up. Years trying to stop spinning everything to make it look like I had no vulnerabilities. Years of, 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 of trying to stuff down uh, everything that was weak <laughs> in me. Uh, now, I know that individual was just trying to turn me into a resilient person. I've become a resilient person. But Jesus himself models vulnerability. I thirst. 
Father, why have you abandoned me? He weeps over the death of Lazarus. It's, it's, it's a biblically authorized thing to be a human being and to have feelings. The Apostle Paul once said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So what are some of the unrealistic or unchristian ways of thinking that have taken root in your mind that may have driven you in ways that produce something very, very different from the abundant life that God wants for you and for the people you influence? What are some of the hang-ups that may be there for you? Can you recognize yourself in any of, of those? And how aware are we of the role, even, that hurts, habits, and hang-ups play in our life and how important addressing them is to the furtherance of God's good purposes through us? As we move to a close today, let me just return, if I may, to the story from John chapter 5 with which we began. You may remember that when we left off, we were at the pool of Bethesda. There are many people there with serious needs, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. And among them is a man who's been an invalid for 38 years. The Bible says that when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, Jesus asked him, do you want to get well? And I've always been fascinated by that statement, that he had been in this condition for a very long time. What do you suppose that condition was? Was it just being an invalid? Was it being an invalid, an invalid who somehow couldn't get to the pool? What was the condition? I find it fascinating that Jesus asks him the question, do you want to get well? I can only conclude that Jesus was either puzzled himself about this uh, circumstance or else he wanted to invite the man to puzzle himself through his own condition. After all, this guy had been blind, lame, paralyzed, the Bible doesn't tell us which, for almost 40 years, and you get the sense he'd spent a lot of that time by the pool of Bethesda. The man goes on to explain that he hasn't been able to get himself uh, into the pool where tradition held healing was possible for him. Could he not have rolled himself into the pool? Could he not have asked some of the people around him, hey, can you help me get into the pool? They were aware that he'd had the condition for 38 years. He must have had a conversational relationship at least with some of the other people there. But nothing had changed. Have you met people like that? I'm not talking here about specifically about physical disabilities, but, but about people in general. Have you met someone who grew accustomed to their problems, who grew complacent about their issues, who became content with their conditions, and who actually got very good at explaining why things in their life were the way they were and could not change. Have you ever known somebody like that? Have you ever been somebody like that? Here's the bottom line. All of us have inherited a sin-soaked nature. All have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. All of us are surrounded by the condition of sin. We've been raised by families, influenced by peers, shaped by cultures that are sin-stained too. And true spiritual, emotional, relational health is hard to find. It truly is. But Jesus is all about that project. <laughs> I have come in order that you might have life and have it more what? Abundantly, healthily, fully, wholly. Being a disciple of Jesus is not simply a matter of getting pie in the sky when we die, though there's hope there for when he makes things totally new. It's, it's not simply a matter of, of memorizing Bible verses or becoming slightly nicer neighbors than other people. Knowing Jesus 
having communion with Jesus, being trained in his word, being a part of his forever family, is meant to help renew us, make us more healthy as it's possible to be in this life. As I've said, not all disabilities or diseases can be overcome or are overcome in this life. Some of them are left with us to serve God's mysterious purposes, perhaps. But a lot of the damaging stuff in our life can be transformed. A lot of the hurts and the habits and the hang-ups can change. They truly can. And to borrow a sentence from the 12-step movement, which, by the way, began in a Christian small group, we can be recoverers. We really can be. How does it happen? How does, how does recovery happen? Well, in no particular order, one act is, is to recognize that you are in a safe place. And I want to say that to you. You are in a safe place. You are at the equivalent of the pool of Bethesda today. You know what the word, by the way, Bethesda in Aramaic means in English? It translates in English as house of grace. You are in a house of grace. You are in a place where it is taken for granted that you are a sinner, <laughs> that you are broken in some ways, that, that, that the full health you're longing for isn't there yet, and that you're surrounded by others of us, just like you, who need the washing <laughs> and the renewing power of God to help us with these things. You do not need to be fully healthy to enter here. We believe in a grace that's greater than the gravity of life, and we're after it together. Strengthened by that knowledge, I hope you will secondly be courageously honest about the things that are depleting you, that are not right about you. Jesus makes it really clear that, that truth, not denial, is our friend. It's the path to freedom. I remember the, the amazing sense of freedom I felt when somehow it finally got through my thick, stubborn head and only because of the influences of Christians in my life that it was okay, it was okay to lose the game. It was a stupid game. It was okay to hurt. It was okay to have made a mistake. It, it's okay to have stumbled and fallen. And everything about my life became, began to get better when God began to change the, the lens through which I looked at myself and his grace. So start by, by doing a fearless moral inventory of the hurts, habits, and hang-ups that may be affecting your inner peace and your relationship with God and, and with other people. Uh, start by just being really honest, courageously honest about what's still stuck. Then thirdly, admit that you are or you may be powerless to overcome all of these things by yourself. Um, and I think that you'd have fixed it by now if you knew how. Uh, you, you may need uh, we may together need a lot more help because if we, if we knew how to make ourselves wonderfully healthy, we would do it, but sin is stubborn and it's insidious. And, and here's the good news. You're not on your own. There is a great physician who wants to help you. His name is Jesus. And he came for those who know they need a doctor and he knows how to repair what is sick or broken in our lives. And he can help us like he did the man by the pool of Bethesda. So finally, at least for today, we're going to return to the topic next week. Finally, put your life afresh in the hands of Jesus. If you, if you will keep returning to this community to this plaza by the pool of his grace, if you will 
keep seeking to follow the direction of Christ, you will become a recoverer. And I want to invite you to make a start today as together we come to the table of communion with him and we ask for his help. May God bless to us this reading and reflection upon his holy word and to him be all the glory. Amen. My soul arise, shake off the guilty fears, the bleeding sacrifice in my behalf. Brothers and sisters, our Lord Jesus Christ has prepared this table for all who know of their desperate need of his transforming grace, for all who will trust him for their salvation, all who are truly sorry for their sins, all who sincerely believe in the Lord Jesus as their Savior and desire in obedience to him 
to follow him as Lord. All for whom this is our condition are invited to come here to this table today and to receive what only he can give. And so come to the joyful feast of our Lord and be transformed as we are joined together now in prayer. With joy we praise you, gracious God, for you have created heaven and earth, made us in your image, and kept covenant with us even when we fell into sin. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ who came as the light of the world to show us your way. In his life you revealed your glory and displayed the full potential for every human life. In his death you paid by grace the price for human sin and opened the way of complete forgiveness for all who trust in his sacrifice. In raising Jesus from the dead, you, O oh God, gave proof of all Christ said and the promise that his disciples shall also rise one day to life eternal. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, that the sharing of the bread that we break and the cup that we bless may be for us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Grant that, being joined together in worship of you today, we may attain to the unity of the faith and grow up into the full character of Christ, becoming his witnesses in all the world. And as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth, into your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd, we pray. Amen. Now I'd like to invite our elders to rise and to come and to join us here at the table. As together we remember the words of the institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord as they are given to us, preserved for us by the Apostle Paul. Paul tells us that on the night in which he was betrayed, our Savior took bread, and after he had given thanks as we have just done, he broke that bread before his disciples and said to them, take and eat, for this is my body, which is given for you. This do every time you eat of it in remembrance of me. Isn't it a pity and a shame? And he never said a mumbling word. Wasn't it a pity and a shame? And he never said a mumbling a word, not a word, not a Peace. 
Gibst ihm in the side, and he never said a mumble in word. They pierced him in the side, and he never said a mumble in. His blood came trickling down, and he never said a mumble in word. His blood came trickling down, and he never said a mumble. Not a word, not a word, not a word. He bowed his head. And he never said a mumble in word. He bowed his head and died. And he never said a mumble in Thank you.
And now, beloved, take and eat, for this is the body of Christ given for you. This we do in remembrance of him. Holy Scripture tells us that in the same way Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you in the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, says the Apostle, You proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes again.
And now, take and drink, for this is the blood of Christ shed for you. This we do in remembrance of him. Let's be joined together in prayer. Please bow your head with me. Great and gracious Lord, you have fed us anew at the table of your truth and grace. And your heart is for this world. As broken as it is, we give thanks for the privilege that it is to now go forth to be witnesses to your life-changing love wherever we go from here. For this we pray in the name of Jesus, and as he taught his disciples to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. ones, as you prepare to go out into the world today, I want to share just one or two final items of news from our family. We're going to be beginning this fall two really exciting, transformative ministries in our church's life with which we would love to have your prayerful help and perhaps your volunteer help. We're going to be beginning in the fall a program we're calling Kids Club, and it's going to be a midweek discipleship program for children in the first through fifth grade age groups. It will take place on Wednesday night, and it will be an incredible way for kids to grow in their faith, build friendships, have fun together, and bond to the life of the church in an even deeper way. Uh, we're looking for volunteers that can help as teachers and leaders in that uh, ministry, and so we hope that uh, you'll pick up one of the Kids Club cards on your way out today, study that, and consider possibly being involved. Secondly, we're going to begin on the 12th of September a new ministry for which we've been preparing for many months now called Celebrate Recovery. Uh, it is a 12-step based biblical program that assists us in uh, dealing with the hurts and the habits and the hang-ups of our lives in a creative way. Uh, most of the people that are involved in Celebrate Recovery uh, don't have a formal addiction program. There may not be a drug or alcohol issue at all, but they're committed to trying to draw 
from God's word and God's grace and God's people the help they need uh, to become even healthier people and witnesses to his life-changing love. Uh, You'll find cards outside that describe that ministry as well. We hope you'll uh, pick that up. And if it's not for you, maybe you know somebody who would be very blessed to be part of that kind of recovery uh, ministry. And then please know that if you came this morning with a burden that you'd like to share and be willing to open uh, yourself to one of our prayer ministers back by the banner at the rear of the sanctuary, uh, some of our prayer ministers are on hand, would love to pray for you. And uh, if you have a moment and you're newer to the church's life, uh, we do a little thing called Christ Church in Five, just a short five-minute orientation to the church. It takes place in the Oak Room to your right on the, off the bridgeway there. And uh, if you stop by, we'd love to get to know you and have a little gift card for you that you can use at the Mission Cafe today or in days to come. And now, go forth into the world in all of the love and the power and the hope of the gospel's message. Seek out the way of the Lord in all of your goings humbly lifting up those who may have fallen down. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit be with you this day till we meet again and forevermore. Amen.